Psychoepistemology 1, Lecture 3. There was one written question, in fact, a uh, computer printed question, so I can't ignore it, um, <laughs> with, with several points, but the person uh, began by saying, uh, you likened the mind to a computer, and I groaned at that. I don't think that's appropriate. I hope nobody got that from my talk. I am not likening the mind to a computer. I'm precisely taking the computer out of the mind and putting it into the subconscious. It's not my analogy. It's Ayn Rand's analogy. I'm extending it in terms of hard drives and so forth, but it's the subconscious that's the computer, not the mind. The mind means the conscious mind. Uh, so that mistake I wanted to cut off at the pass. Yes? She says, when I talk about retrieving, I said the question could be implicit. Yes, the rest of you, if you want to ask, could you go up to the uh, microphone? What do I mean by an implicit question? I don't know anything other than the way it feels. You don't always hear in your mind a question. Sometimes I do. Sometimes I think, you know, well, what am I going to wear? What shirt am I going to put on today? Other times, I don't hear an actual worded question, but I have the feeling of going for an answer. Uh, and if you were to put into words what my mental set is at that point, it would be, what shirt am I going to wear today? But I haven't used the words. So I just ask you to introspect and see how you would form it. But we don't always hear before every thought a sentence ending in a question mark. Yes. Uh, you mentioned that your psychoepistemology can mainly be improved by practice. Are there any specific books or courses that, that give concrete steps and in, in, in good ways to do this that you can recommend? Yes. I, now, should I repeat the question, or since it's amplified, it isn't necessary? Books or courses I can re recommend are all the objectivist books and courses, and, in, <laughs> and only those, and in two regards. First of all, a lot of them are concerned with what is the right way to think. Like, uh, what is an essential? What things are true? How do you determine truth? What are the preconditions of even there being such a thing as truth, which is metaphysics? And what does it mean to you, which is ethics? And the other thing is to uh, read and reread the, the well written material because it's written with a good psychoepistemology, and that alone to some extent, automatizes you in the right way of thinking. Now, you're not a, you know, a uh, parrot or a uh, pliable piece of putty, so it's not that just by memorizing Galt's speech, you clean up your, all your subconscious files. But there is an effect of being exposed to essentialized thinking uh, that's very helpful in uh, making clear to you what is good thinking and what is not. So that is um, the best thing I could say to you is read Ayn Rand's writings, read them over and over again, and pay attention to what she says and doesn't say, I mean in the way she says something, how she essentializes and streamlines. Uh, other than that, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. Set back microphone, yes. Um, in our everyday lives, we have to deal with people who have faulty psychoepistemology. And I wonder if uh, understanding that can help us deal with them in a better way. Yes, uh, very much so. If you can identify which problem that they have, you can try to present them with information in a way they can better deal with it. For instance, what occurs to me offhand is if you know a person is an empiricist psychoepistemological, concrete bound, then you don't want to hit them right away with very abstract ideas. You want to lead them up slowly, starting from the concretes and always giving a lot of concrete examples. 
if a person is a rationalist, you want to constantly ask them, well, what does that mean in reality? Or let me show you what I'm talking about in reality and why it's not arbitrary. So you can um, uh, not, I don't mean in any way, accept a person's disabilities, but if you know a person's weak in a certain area, like uh, either <laughs> facts of reality or <laughs> abstractions, you can try to help them more in the area that they're weak in. So yes, it's very helpful, and even in personal relationships, uh, love relationships and so forth. If you know how your partner processes information, it gives you a tremendous advantage in dealing with them and uh, makes intelligible what otherwise is quite baffling if you have a different psychoepistemology. And of course these things come in degrees. You could be very logical and rational, but with a slight touch of empiricism or rationalism, for instance. I don't mean that everybody is David Hume inside their subconscious or on the other side Plato. It comes in degrees. So yeah, I think it's tremendously helpful. Tremendously helpful in dealing with people. But it's hard to, often hard to diagnose. Yes? Um, I knew you were going to be talking about creativity and this is something out of Ayn Rand's last letter of the Ayn Rand letter where I think she was talking directly about what creativity is. Mm -hmm. um, this is why I was unable to automatize the process of writing an mm -hmm. article. What I was asking of myself was a contradiction, and I think she underlined yes. contradiction. One automatizes the known, one cannot automatize the new. Thanks. Yeah, it's, that's, I wish I had thought of that. That's an excellent example because you can't be creative and go for the new and non-obvious by some kind of routine. That's a direct contradiction. That's exactly what I was saying that the, uh, the opposition is between things like multiplication, just go through the rules, and things where you have to ask a lot of questions and figure out what questions to ask. I mean, that's one question you should always ask yourself. What question should I be asking myself? <laughs> now, do you want to know, before I take another question, I think you want to know the results of the homework. What I had hoped would be revealed, and was revealed, but not as dramatically as I wished, was that having to give eight examples of things you would do would push you to be more creative. And to some extent, the data bore that out as judged by the following statistics. I went through and I just checked what I thought were good creative answers. For instance, a good answer which is not creative is uh, look for a job in the one X. There's nothing wrong with your giving that because I didn't tell you, you know, go out of your way to be creative. But I wouldn't check that. But uh, one of the ones that I, the only one person gave, for instance, that I never heard of, I mean, that's the wrong way to put it, didn't occur to me was go where there are a bunch of homeless people and ask what they have done in the past. Now, obviously, if they're still homeless, they haven't succeeded, but these guys go, <laughs> you know, they go in and out of shelter and ask what, where they found work. And I'm sure some, a lot of them have been able to find little part-time jobs. Now, I consider that a creative answer. It's not obvious. Um, so I went through completely neutrally, just checking the ones that I thought were especially non-obvious and creative good solutions. And then the question was, where did the more creative answers come? At the end of your list or at the beginning of your list? And it turned out that number eight had more check marks than any of the others. Um, not dramatically so. Uh, I didn't have the large enough sample, but there were eight check marks for number eight. And the other, uh, sec the runner-up had six. Then I looked at the last four and the first four answers, and I had more check marks, about a third more check marks in the last four, the second half of your answers, than in the first half. Now I hope you guys did write your answers down in the order they occurred to you. That was the assignment. Uh, there were an awful lot of creative marks for number one, which I interpret in the following way. That is your first answer, six people got check marks for creative in answering number one. 
I think that before you got around to putting your pen on paper, you were germinating these things in your head, and you got one that you liked, and you wrote that one down first. So I think it's kind of skewed with number one. But even so, there were more creative answers on eight than on number one or any of the others, and more in the second half than in the first half. Now, I was not um, bowled over by the degree of the difference, but I ask you this. Suppose you had to spend three weeks figuring out the best thing to do if you were homeless and really getting it down. Don't you think you would come up with a lot more creative, non-obvious, and terrific solution than if you had stopped with number one and two here? I mean, I think that's clearly true, and that's the, the theory I'm trying to uh, sell to you. If you want to be creative, then just work longer, do more, keep coming up with different solutions until you get it. It took Ayn Rand 12 years to write out Le Shrug, you know. Um, okay, uh, I did want to, I will give later, uh, I will go through some of the other interesting answers just to give you a little reward for doing the assignment, but I want to get some questions, yes. The first microphone, you right there. Uh, in popular culture and self-help uh, recommendations, it's common to find a, something that sounds like what you're talking about, where you're invited to send messages to your subconscious, like affirmations, that are untrue, which, which you hope to be true. Like you're fat, and you say to yourself every morning, I'm thin, I'm thin, I'm, you know, that sort of thing. Could you comment on the relationship of that to the kind of uh, work you're doing here, or have described? Well, that gets a little beyond my expertise, so I'll give you a layman's, that's, that's really getting into uh, psychology in a way that I haven't thought about and am not uh, competent to, but let me give you nonetheless my spontaneous reaction to that. To the extent that it works, it works because you are convincing yourself that this is possible. To the extent that you're actually convincing yourself it's actual, it's counterproductive. If you say, I'm thin, I'm thin, I'm thin, when you're fat, you're either going to consider yourself a liar or you're going to believe yourself and not die. However, if the real meaning of that is I can become thin, I, am, I deserve to be thin, I will be thin, when I do the following thing. I think that's very motivating. The big killer of motivation is the feeling that you can't succeed. That's why self-esteem is such a critical, fundamental need behind all value achievement. The big barrier people face is they feel, I can't do it. Or, you know, well, maybe theoretically I can do it, but I can't picture myself doing it. And when you become convinced there will be, you know, in a year I'll be there. I will be this way that I want to be, thin or better vocabulary or wealthy or whatever it is. It's tremendously liberating. So to the extent that techniques do that, they will work. So you do need to visualize your goal and convince yourself you absolutely are going to be there. And it has to be a realistic goal. You can't, you know, take some ridiculous goal and just talk yourself into it. For something where you've seen other people do it, you know there are steps to achieve it, you can define how you're going to get there, then visualizing yourself there is a very important motivational technique. Uh, let me take a question. Is that Shane? Pardon? Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Um, my question is about uh, the role of psychoepistemology and the unit perspective. Um, in what? In, the, in uh, achieving the unit perspective. Um, what is achieving the inner perspective? Um, okay, that's maybe not. I'm, is I, that's, I'm, in, in terms of uh, um, viewing a specific entity as a unit rather than as an entity. I oh, mean, the unit perspective. Yes. yes. Oh. Um, now, and, you made a mistake already. I know. <laughs> but because that's you the don't achieve the unit perspective, you are struck by similarities. Mm hmm. The unit perspective is not an achievement. It's, it's something that happens to a child when it gets to a certain age, and it'll happen to anybody who seeks out similarity. It's not, so that's, that is not something to be called an achievement, the, the unit perspective. It's not like, well, I'm looking at these people, and I got the perspective 
upon them as just perceptual and now I'm going to achieve the unit perspective you are human beings yes I've got it now I've achieved it. or anything more complicated no matter how high the abstraction okay now that I've shot down the attempt to formulate your question go ahead <laughs> <laughs> well I wasn't um, I'm uh, not looking at just you know uh, the unit perspective as a whole but I mean look looking and seeing a particular thing as a unit, uh, just reaching the stage of being able to do that, and I was just wondering. In childhood. In, ch in childhood, uh -huh. um, and I was wondering um, how much, if any, of the process beyond the recollection of uh, um, past similar entities uh, in viewing this new uh, entity as a unit was uh, psychoepistemological rather than epistemological. I don't think I understand the question, but it. It also sounds like uh, I, I understand now why you your question confused me. You you have to distinguish between the one-year-old context and the adult context. A one-year-old doesn't have any psychoepistemology, mm -hmm. so it's not possible to when you're talking about making it up to the conceptual level that precedes any psychoepistemology at all. So. Uh, the concept doesn't apply there. It's only once, once you've reached the conceptual level. So that's why I assumed you were on an adult level, because that's where psychoepistemology applies, or at least a conceptual level. And that's why I, I criticize you saying achieving the unit perspective. That happens at age one or before. So uh, there's a mistake in the question. Okay. Let me take the next question. Thank you. Yes. I have a question about. Um, I've heard creativity described as doing a lot of mulling over what you're thinking about and then suddenly coming, coming to you in an instant. Can you right. talk about the psychopistemology of that? Thank you. Yes, because that's one of the theories that I no longer agree with. And uh, a lot of uh, objectivists do believe that there's stages, you know, there's the preparation stage and then the mulling stage and then the flash of Insight, which although not mystical, is, is different from what happens when you do ordinary thinking. And this book and introspection persuaded me that that just isn't so. There's the same kind of logical thinking and uh, question asking and answering in creative thinking as in any other kind of thinking. And the big explosion of insight and emotional elation that you get comes from the size of the problem, not from some different psychopistemology. It's the same elation and excitement that you get when you're trying to remember that guy's name. What is that guy's name? Oh yeah, Lloyd Benson. And you get a little, oh yeah, click the end in. Now that no one would say, oh, creative, the creative insight, the period of exultant emotion and so forth. Um, it's the same thing when you think of, I could have Rourke blow up a housing project for the poor, and you see everything fits together, just that the stakes are so much higher that rather than saying, oh yeah, Lloyd Benson, <coughs> and a little smile, you're sent into rapture because you've solved a problem, I mean, Ayn Rand solved a problem that, that plagued her for years on a major aspect of her life, I mean, of her life's work, how to get the climax for the fountainhead. So uh, I've come completely away from that idea that there's anything different in creative thinking than there is in regular, ordinary thinking. Uh, it's just more, the, the thinking part is more, the conscious part is more. And that's good because it means you don't have to go through, am I in stage one or should I be in the mulling stage? <laughs> it's true, it's important sometimes to get away from your problems because it let you stand back from them. But that's true in ordinary thinking too. So it's not that some of the practical suggestions of, uh, you know, get rest and get away from the problem and come back to it. Of course that's a good idea, but that's a good idea if you're doing your income tax. <laughs> yes, Shane. Yeah, have you thought about the value of a conscious philosophy in filing? Um, I'm sure most of us have had the experience of being able to think much more smoothly when we can stick an issue in the right branch of philosophy. Yes, I, I have, uh, but uh, just the comment I made that in an objectivist society of the future or objectivism dominated society, 
when people are raised with the right philosophy and trained to think logically, uh, they will be much better. And actually, you can just see it generation by generation, starting with, say, uh, 1776 and going every 20 years, you can see the degradation in the logic exhibited by the writers and the level of average working intelligence of people, say in the 19th century versus today. The dumbing down of America is psychoepistemological. And Ayn Rand wrote the article, The Comprachicos, uh, to explain that. Uh, maybe at this point I should make that comment uh, about cultural change and give you that problem about placeholders also. Uh, placeholders is trivial, so let me give that one. Uh, Brothers and sisters have I none, but this man's father is my father's son. Who is he? Brothers and sisters have I none, but this man's father is my father's son. Now what makes that tortuous <laughs> is you have too many placeholders and when you... This man's father is my father's son, but I have no... You can't, it's too many, you have to have your finger held in too many positions at once to grasp the relationship. It's a variation on my saying, oh, she's my cousin's father's uncle's sister's brother's dentist. You, know, <laughs> you just can't hold that many nested operations. Each one requires a placeholder. Uh, brothers and sisters have I none, but this man's father is my father's son. Who is he? My son, yes. If you, think, if you work it out on paper. You can see, start with, who is my father's son? It's me. Anyway, you can work that through. But I think that's a good example of the special kind of confusion require, uh, that results when you have too many placeholders. I think boggling and, and, and being confused in that way is introspectively identifiable. As you've got too many balls in the air at once, you can't you can't find your place anymore because you've only got two placeholders to work with and when you pick one up and move it to there you lost where you were here. That's the way I experience it. Okay, now the other thing is about cultural change. It's a little bit bigger. Uh, the battle for ideas is really not over content, it's over psychoepistemology. That was the theme of the section I didn't have time to give. And I learned this gradually in my own experience of dealing with philosophy professors. Uh, if you ask yourself, or if you ask me, rather, how many philosophy professors are there who were philosophy PhDs first, then discovered objectivism, hmm. rather than starting out as objectivists and going to get a PhD? How many? Uh, non-objectivist PhDs were there who became convinced objectivists who would now say, I agree with the philosophy of objectivism. The answer is, how many are there? Zero. Zero. Right. Uh, and I think the reason for that, in my own experience, not just from objectivist principles, is they cannot understand objectivism because they've automatized, in order to get a PhD, a context-dropping, minutia-seeking, anti-essential psychoepistemology. And they simply then don't know how to take in and absorb and under, understand the objectivist philosophy. So the problem is that we can't communicate with the present non-objectivist PhDs, but then the solution is we have to grow our own. You have to start as an objectivist before you get your PhD. And we have to replace the current intellectuals, not convince them. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, we are over our time. Should I take one more? Where's I can go to 1215? Great. 
Yeah, I was uh, thinking about what characterizes an essential difference between a uh, a good thinker, you know, someone who can sit in. A and good a, thinker and what? Between a good thinker and, and a poor thinker, i.e., someone who could sit in on a uh, lecture on a f philosophical subjects and grasp what's being said versus just have it, you know, not get anything out of it at all. And was wondering if if you would. Uh, answer the question as that about the thought I had on that as to whether one crucial difference is the the automatis, automatization and the process of giving one's mind standing orders on the subject of identifying essentials both automatizing yeah. you know this flash real time identification of essentials combined with well I didn't grasp the essential but I'm going but since I have identified that I have not grasped the, the essential, that's the crucial thing to do right now, and it's the most important thing to do, so yeah, that I can, I, that I can I keep can this context going. To the essential. Yes, I think you're right that the, the big difference in psychopistemologies is the degree of essentialization or the degree of automatic respect for essentials. And the symbol for me here is Dr. Peacock, who is, his mind is so clean and so well organized. Everything is in its place and he always can put his finger right on the one word that names what he's trying to communicate to you. Uh, and obviously it's a lifetime of fanatical drive to reduce things to the essential. Uh, those who have been in the Objectivist Graduate Center have experienced a couple of evenings when he discussed editing with us and the importance of getting rid of unnecessary words. And he's amazing at what he can do just in, on the level of words to, to unclutter things. So I think a, a mind that wants to know maybe doesn't have the term essential, wants to know what does this all come down to? And that's a driving question always in its mind is the mind that's going to be thinking in principles and is going to be a clean, rational mind. The other thing that I think is important is a love of knowledge. And this I um, immodestly got from myself. I can remember back to uh, kindergarten I loved facts and I collected facts and every everything I learned was like a little gem for me that I stored in my subconscious as an, something I knew about the world and I think that attitude is very important in developing a, um, a good psychoepistemology. Yes, Gail? I have a question about your comments about creative insight and it happening all at once. Um, the kind of thought that I think that you're talking about when you say creative thinking applies to what I would call sort of pushing the envelope of new thought. But when it comes to aesthetic creativity, like in creating a song or a painting or something such like that, it often seems to come all at once. And I wonder if that's related mm -hmm. to the emotion that you're trying to convey, or if it's something else, or what you might have to say about that. Uh, how does this apply, if at all, my statements on creativity, to artistic creativity, where the product can come all at once? Uh, I don't think, um, now I can't speak for music, which is kind of a separate area. Uh, and it's intimately, music is intimately connected with the brain functions, a special case. But I don't think in the others things come all, <clears throat> all at once. I think parts of them call, come all at once. But uh, I think of a comment that Frank O'Connor made to me about painting. He said he spends as much time looking at the model and thinking about it before picking up a brush to begin painting as he does in the entire painting. So it's half just looking at the model and thinking about what he's going to do and then the other half is painting it. 
Now, individual, you know, parts of it, I'm sure, can pop in, and I allow for the possibility that a whole completed idea can pop in, but I think this is very rare um, in the history of art. He deals with that in this book and says that some of the famous uh, reported cases of a whole product appearing in the mind are lies. Uh, now, that doesn't mean they all are or that they are badly motivated, but uh, I've become very um, very much more on the thinking side, although recognizing that pieces fall into place and that makes that final connection and that gives you a big chunk of it. But there's still an awful lot of work that has to be done before and after that to get the piece, get your ducks lined up in a row and then to see if it's good. Sometimes you get the integration and you got the answer, only it isn't the answer. That also. I've heard though that in, at least with songwriting. My mm -hmm. husband is a songwriter. Uh, for him... Uh, Lyrics or music? Both. For yeah. him though, in writing the lyrics specifically, if he starts a song and you know has it for a while and then has an interruption and goes back to it later, he's lost it because the emotional state that he was in to, to create the song is hard to repeat again. So you sort of lose that thread along. Anyway, for him, I think it happens all at once, at least in the context of, of his own songwriting. I didn't know what you might think about that, since you're not really addressing uh, music. I don't know what to think of it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's not impossible, uh, but I don't think that um, I think if you look at really good songwriting, and I don't know John's songs, I've never seen one, but I bet you any amount of money if you look at Cole Porter for, say, for lyrics and songs, <clears throat> that he spent weeks laboring over every song. <clears throat> I think of Cole Porter as someone who has very good lyrics. <clears throat> um, now, <clears throat> Musical themes, just the music, do, because they're more connected to the brain, they do just make themselves heard. According to many composers, including Rachmaninoff and Tchaikovsky, they just hear as if they're listening to a record, sometimes a whole orchestrated score. And then it's just the effort to write it down and uh, edit it. I think that's a separate case because of the direct connection with the brain. But of course, you know, this doesn't happen to people who aren't prepared. Uh, the old and the new theory of creativity would agree that you uh, make creative connections only if you've stocked your subconscious over a long period of time with all the materials out of which you'll make these connections. Yes. Um, if you think that uh, control over your mind and your ability to change uh, your character is bounded uh, within a certain time, then when, what is the point at, at which a person cannot uh, change his character? And wouldn't you say that the choice to control one's thinking within a certain period of time is more difficult for some than for others? There were a lot of questions here. I'm not sure I got all of them. <clears throat> the one that stuck out in my mind was, when is it too late to change your character? Well, it's never too late to change your character from good to bad. You can always do that. Um, when is it too late to change your character from bad to good? The only thing I can conceive of is when you've done some unforgivable crime, such as murder. Uh, because the first step in improving your character is to admit the evil of what you've done and to start enacting justice. And justice in that case would mean that you take your own life. So outside of high crimes, capital you know, crimes, uh, it's never too late, but it's a lot easier the sooner you start. So it's much easier for a 15-year-old to reform himself than it is for a 65-year-old. But there are 65-year-olds uh, who do noticeably improve. And um, 
therefore there is no uh, time limit on it in that way. But it's just, it's, you've got more past mistakes to undo if you're older and they're more deeply ingrained. Thank you. But the way you do it, of course, is just by trying to keep your mind going, trying to define what's right and do it, starting, you know, from that instant in everything that you can. And in the beginning, it will be completely alien to the person and he won't trust himself. And the sign of a better character is he begins to have more confidence in himself and to trust himself and not to be tempted to do uh, immoral actions. After all, he begins to like doing productive, creative uh, actions. The best thing that's been written on that is The Criminal Personality by Stanton Samenow uh, because they've created a process he and his uh, mentor Yokelson created a process that works with criminals and it's a retraining of the thinking. It's a psychoepistemological process that they use to improve the character of the uh, prisoners who want to have that happen by improving their thinking. I totally agree with your um, idea or your model of the conscious mind feeding both data and structure to the subconscious. Um, I wanted to bring up two examples where I believe that the subconscious integrated um, that into a what I would call creativity. One is uh, Reardon's second design of the bridge of the John Galt line. He didn't realize that he had redesigned it until he was talking to Dagny about it and mm -hmm. suddenly I have redesigned it. The second is when um, benzene, when the, when the chemical was, uh, the actual formula of it, the structure of it was um, realized it came to, it came in the form of a dream, the serpent biting his tail. Right. And obviously both of these had all of the conscious mind feeding the subconscious all the data that it needed to integrate, but I feel like it was done in the subconscious. I must not have spoken clearly because I agree with everything you say. I'm not denying that there is a phenomenon of the subconscious integration. I'm saying that this is the same phenomenon that we see in a lot of other cases. Uh, it's not, it's part and parcel of thinking. It's just that sometimes more pieces come together on a more important topic. But uh, you're trying to remember the name of somebody and you can't get it. You go away from it. Now, how many times have you had this happen? I have it happen all the time. If I try to get it, I can't get it. So I put it away and a half hour later, up comes the name, unbidden. I'm saying that's the same process, that there are things in your subconscious that are uh, ready to come up in things that are not, and we experience that all the time, not just in creative thinking. It's only that in creative thinking, this, the subconscious integration is more important, is more noticed by us, because what we have is some tremendous solution to some problem, like, uh, what's the name of the guy with the benzene ring? I could not tell you, I've forgotten. It's Who? not in my subconscious. Kekule. <laughs> He'd been working on this problem for uh, two or, or more years on one problem. How could benzene, six, six atoms of carbon, be arranged in a stable structure? So when you get the answer of six years of work, even if the process, the mechanics, is the same by which you remember somebody's name, or you have any, uh, I don't want to make it just retrieval, but you solve any little problem, but it's at the end of years and years of work, and it wins you the Nobel Prize, there's, it looks like a different kind of thing, but it's just more of the same kind of thing. That's what I'm saying. That it's more of the same kind of thing that we experience all the time. Thank okay? you. Thank you.